Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Yellow Gloves podcast. Today we're going to be talking about Cage Warriors 157 in London. Just an unbelievable card. So many fucking insane moments, so many cool fights, so many, I guess, emotional bits to it as well, which we'll get into. But really and truly, it was just a special card from top to bottom. It, I guess it took a while to get going. There were It was a bit slow to start off, but once it hit its stride, it never really stopped going. One of my favorite Cage Warriors cards in recent memory, to be completely honest here. It's worth pointing out kind of right off the bat. There won't be a preview for the Cage Warriors Rome card, which is this Saturday, purely because I'm already recording this and I'll be recording a recap of that as well. It just feels like overkill to have so much out in such a short period of time. But I'm very, very excited for that. Probably do a little bit of a main event preview at the end of this episode, but I just wanted to kind of set that expectation there. But let's get into Cage Warriors 157. We'll start as we always do from the main event and we'll work our way down. So in our main event, we had Mick Stanton versus James Webb. The rematch, of course, this time for the belt. They fought back in 2020 and it was not very competitive. I mean, James Webb very handily beat on Mick Stanton and we talked about it in the preview episode. But what did I say in the preview episode? I said that don't count out Mick Stanton. He's improved so much in the last few years. Yes, he's getting on, he's 36 years old, but that doesn't mean that you can't learn new things and you can't improve as a fighter. This fight was insane. One of the best one-rounders in Cage Warriors history, and you will know how much that means if you know about some of the one-rounders that have been hosted in this organization. All I need to say is Nathaniel Wood, Josh Reed, right? And this felt just as special, just a really insane five minutes or for as long as it lasts I think it lasted four minutes and 20 seconds if we're being like completely you know legit on the numbers but it was it was really just just an insane fight because when they locked the two of them in the cage James Webb looked massive and he just the way he started digging to the body just swarming Stanton early it was just insane and Stanton was fighting well off the back foot I thought and I mean I mean it it showed when we get to actually discussing the the crux of what happened at the end of the fight but in my opinion Webb was was fighting really really well obviously but Stanton was doing well off the back foot but he was getting hit right Webb was throwing hard to the head and to the body and it was the body shot specifically that dropped Stanton midway through the first round he recovered well. I mean, Webb went straight down with him, tried to take his back, which made sense. Webb is a very credible grappler. Stanton's been choked out quite a few times in his career. And, you know, he was just resolute, defended the position well, managed to get back to his feet. Webb delivered another dig to the body, which kind of momentarily froze or folded Stanton. And at that point, you know, I take notes throughout the fights. And the note that I have just prior to the finish is, Webb is bullying Stanton around the cage, but Stanton just zero regard for anyone's opinion. Crashes forward after being on the back foot, crashes forward, lands a good one too, and lands another shot, and it drops, it, it, mo it kind of wobbles Webb, and then it drops him, and then it's shot after shot after shot. Goddard jumping in there. We'll talk about Mark Goddard in this card because he was just insane in this card in the best way possible. You know, Goddard steps in, a lot of ground strikes unanswered from James Webb. I know there was a lot, especially like the, the Irish MMA media guys, I know a lot of people were upset at the stoppage there, but I don't think you can blame Goddard for stopping it. It was a, quite a few unanswered strikes. I know the visual of James Webb reflexively just getting up and I'm still in the fight kind of thing, but that's we see that all the time, right? You one of my biggest pet peeves in MMA is just because someone starts to move and starts to push the minute that the ref takes the other guy off top of him that doesn't mean that he was in ever in the fight right in, in that moment I think Stanton had him dead to rights he would have just continued striking nothing would have changed Webb wasn't really improving position just because the ref steps in and suddenly X fighter you know starts to move and starts to be emphatic in his movements and, and protests that doesn't mean that it was a bad stoppage and I think it was a fair stoppage Mick Stanton 36 years of age that's in it's 
absolutely insane what he's doing in 2023. Easy, easy shoeing for Yellow Gloves Fighter of the Year. It's going to take quite a lot to beat it, in my opinion, because we're halfway through the year. And beating Will Curry the way that he did as an underdog was was impressive. Went all 25 minutes with a vivacious, younger, you know, physically fitter, just specimen of a fighter that Will Curry is. And Will Curry looked great on this card, and we'll get to that later. But Stanton just, you know, took that decision and and won the belt right and that was a big enough moment and I think a lot of people thought Stanton's got his belt now that's it kind of he's not going to be defending it it's he's probably going to lose the first chance that he he gets to defend it and didn't happen right goes in there against a guy who handily beat him three years ago that's not a long time ago goes in there knocks the guy out in the first round just unbelievable from Nick Stanton a great underdog story a great story of veterans you guys will always know that i harp on about veteran fighters and i love the dogged vets in this sport i love the guys that are still kicking around at 34 35 and they're not you know there's a difference between the guys who are kicking around and they're getting knocked the fuck out every week right and obviously that you, you don't want to see but i love the veteran guys who are in there regularly at a you know at an age where most people have already retired they're still going and they might lose one here or there but they're not getting embarrassed they're not getting just plastered out like they're just going right and they're still chugging along and, and Mick Stanton's doing that with a belt wrapped around his waist incredible I think he'll get another one in before the end of the year purely because there's quite a few cards towards the end of the year he didn't really you know he did get folded a couple times to the body but he didn't take any kind of concussive damage any head trauma anything like that I think we'll see Mick Stanton again rematch against Darren Stewart is probably the shout in my opinion would have liked to have seen Stanton Bonner more you know but obviously Bonner lost to Darren Stewart so you can't do that but Darren Stewart Stanton good enough rematch Stanton dominated Stewart in the first fight last year Stewart's then gone on he's won three zip he's looked pretty good both from the grappling perspective and also his striking still looks as good as it has been be an, be an interesting fight in my opinion I don't sound too hyped about it now maybe I need a bit of promos and a bit of kind of uh, you know a, a bit of flair from Cage Warriors to sell me on it it's just it was such a it, it was such a, a drab fight the first one even though Stanton dominated I've got no real interest in watching it again but I do have interest in watching Stanton defend against whoever the hell it is so bring it on this was a great main event a great one rounder, a one rounder banger, as I like to call him. Props to Mick Stanton, just insane. What what a like end of his career he's having. It's just really special. All right, moving on along in the card, we've got the co main event, which was Jordan Vucenic versus Brees Picol. Interesting fight, purely because I didn't really rate Pico coming into this I didn't know a crazy amount about him I did as much research as the next man you would have heard it in the preview pod I knew what this was it was uh, another opportunity for Vucenic to show that he's he's back and that he's just as good as, as he's ever been right and it was practically that just total domination from Vucenic it's crazy to me that you know just how talent rich this 145 pound division is for cage warriors how how many of these fighters could really just go into the ufc and just do a good job like vucenic hughes charrier these are guys that probably you know you could argue should already be in the ufc and i think charrier more from like a, a popularity perspective it's insane to me that you know they're doing shows in paris that they go into france regularly now you've not got charrier you need Sharia. If you want those loud arenas, you want those loud pops, Sharia is the, the popular pick. But, you know, I, I'm digressing a bit from Vucenic. Vucenic is, what did I, well, not even what did I say in the last episode on the preview pod. The one thing I always say is Vucenic is one of the best back takers in MMA. And I always, always, always preface it because, I, you know, I don't like sounding like I'm, I'm overblowing things. But I do mean in MMA. Like people will be like, oh, you mean in cage wars? No, I mean in MMA. Like Jordan Vucenic is one of the best back takers in MMA. And all you need to do is watch him. And the more that people watch him and the more popular that he gets and the more that your you know fight analysts on Twitter start sharing really cool 
analysis videos like here's how Jordan Vucenic gets to the back here's what Vucenic does when he gets to the back that's when people will start to respect it and and look it was the it was the back take that that was all that Vucenic really needed and when he got it just a slick rear naked choke like it was always going to be round two submission actually that was my my official pick for this fight was a round two submission over on topology but you know just to talk a bit more about the fight because you know there was still some some work that was done in there because it was a second round finish but in the first round Vucenic was just managing his range early setting good traps fainting kicking from either stance he just looks so sharp in there like Vucenic just looks like he's hit a, another level and I know he's fighting guys that he probably should be beating but I you, there's sometimes you just watch a fighter fight it doesn't matter who they're fighting you can just tell that they're in a different zone that they're in a different kind of level to what they were previously and that was Vucenic in this fight Pico was swinging for the fences early and, and Vucenic was crashing the range so well like just whenever Pico was was starting to to find something just there was Vucenic right on top of him nice left hooks finding his range shooting for the takedown and once he got the takedown in the first round he knew that was his path just smothered Pico on the ground clean 10-9 and then like I said in the second round takedown early immediately works his way to the back gets both hooks in cool as you like rear naked choke say it again one of the best back takers in all of MMA props to Jordan Vucenic I don't know what's next for him I hope it's you know the more established names in the division because I don't always like seeing him against like the the debutants and, and people that we've not really seen fight in Cage Warriors. So, you know, I'll, I'll the Ferranti fight I'll give to Cage Warriors because that that was a fun one and you know Ferranti was six and zero oh, had a you know had always finished this fight. So I get that that might have been a cool one to do, especially as they're trying to build up the Italians. This Pico fight, it was what it was. Want to see Vucenic in there against the more you know the more established names of the division again want to see him right back up there in title contention cannot wait Jordan Vucenic is back ladies and gentlemen and the sport is is much better for it and so we segue into the Morgan Charrier Diego Silva fight an easy segue to make because of the history that Charrier and Vucenic have the history that Charrier has with pretty much all the good featherweights in this division and this this fight with Diego Silva was it was a fight, you know. I'm trying not to, to, to rag on it too much, but it wasn't incredibly entertaining. It wasn't incredibly memorable. Obviously, Charrier gets the gets the finish very, very late into round three. I think he just eventually broke Silva. Um Silva just, just seemed to have had enough by the end of that third round towards towards the end of it even. But I will always I always say this about Charrier. I think the Charrier is a very very good fighter, but I think in terms of excitement, you're never really going to get a crazy amount of in cage excitement out of Charrier. He's had good moments, knockout of a good win, which I always talk about. You know his previous fight um, earlier on in the year at Cage Warriors Dublin, really awesome finish after being caught in in like a modified triangle for like four minutes of the round. It felt like, but. It, it always makes me think like, like Charrier isn't incredibly exciting and I think the the concept of Charrier the idea of Charrier is a lot more exciting than what we actually get out of Charrier and what we get out of him is a winning fighter is a very good fighter a technically capable a technically sound a well-rounded fighter but sometimes you get fights like this from him because he is low output and when he's low output and he's not getting anything back from his opponent in Diego Silva it's a bit of a drag. Like Sharia looked fast early, dropped Diego Silva with a calf kick really, really early in the fight, tried to get the rear naked choke, and Silva was just frozen the entire fight. Uh, he dropped Silva in the second round. They were both exchanging hooks. Sharia got the had the range and, and had the power and, and dropped Silva. Chopping calf kick was there for Sharia the whole fight, but it was really, really low output. And we know that Sharia is low output most of the time anyways but like I said if he's not getting anything back from 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 his opponent it becomes even more of a slog to watch it was more of that in the third round Silva just started shooting over and over out of desperation Charrier just eventually frames off the head 
and just starts to unleash a bunch of strikes. Rich Mitchell had seen enough by that point and stepped in, you know. Definitely forgettable. Definitely a weird fight, but Sharia won't care, right? He's, he's three three wins in a row now for the Frenchman after losing to, to Paul Hughes. Paul Hughes obviously called Sharia out for UFC Paris. Obviously, neither of them are signed to the UFC, so it feels a bit fruitless. But UFC, you do it. You absolute cowards. Book this fight. Put it on the Paris card. Paul Hughes should already be signed. Sharia should already be on your roster. If you're going to France once a year, Sharia, th there's no reason why this man shouldn't be on your roster. The, the amount of fans that he has, the vibe in the arena when this guy fights... And look, for, for all I said about he's not always the most entertaining, when he is entertaining, it's super fucking memorable. Goodwin knockout, again, the comeback against Pedro Souza. He also had the, the Truman knockout as well. And he's he's good even in tough fights, the Hughes fight, the Vucenic fight. I know these are fights he lost, but they are contentious decisions, close decisions. And it's, it's tough, right, to contextualize Charrier because you don't want to oversell Charrier, but... I mean, the guy's 27 years of age. He's still so young, and he's already had, like, what is it, 28 fights now? At 27 years of age, that's pretty crazy. I think put him in the UFC, he's not going to set the world alight, but if they do the Paris thing regularly, if they do France regularly, which they should, now that, you know, the sport's been legalized over there and it's it's easier to, to get fights done over there, get Charrier in. Do Charrier Hughes too. That would be so sick in Paris, in my opinion. Just do it. So moving on in the main card, we had Daniel Skibinski versus Maddas Fleminas. What did I tell you guys? Maddas Fleminas is that guy. He's for real. Everyone always says it, but I'll say it again. This man has wins over, right? Over George Hardwick has wins over Oban Elliott, Jesse O'Holan, which probably isn't going to mean much to a lot of people because of the way the MMA, the MMA world works and thinks about fights. He's also by the way, got a win over the, the middleweight champion, Mick Stanton. So, and Matt Bonner as well. So, <laughs> Fleminas is no joke. And finally, finally, he's in that conversation for the title shot. And not even in the conversation. He is 100% one half of the title fight. Whenever Cage Warriors decide to do it, the belt that Reese McKee has vacated, Maddis Fleminas has to be one half of that title match. I don't care what else happens in this world what else happens in MMA what else happens in Cage Warriors Maddus Feminas needs to fight for that belt the amount of entertaining fights he's put on for the organisation, the amount of quality quality opposition he's taken out, another one here in Skibber who's one of the you know, one of the, the most dogged veterans in, in the European circuit has his fair share of losses but also has his fair share of wins right and coming off a win against a, a very, very credible and very highly rated Emil Brown, who did a few special things on this card, and we'll get to that later. But all I'll say is title shot right fucking now for Maddus Fleminas. The Latvian Express is, is about to take off. And listen, I'm the conductor. I'm there driving this damn thing because I've, I've been the number one Fleminas guy for the longest time. Love this guy. I think he's such an incredible fighter. I think he's so fun. He's awkward, but he's also technically sound at the same time. He finds a great marriage between the two. And in this fight, you saw it right off the bat. I mean, he came out with that same spear and jab that he messed Mantikivi up with. And, you know, Skibber was eating that like it was his dinner, his breakfast, his lunch. Skibber kept going for the takedown attempts. Fleming Asto, really strong hips, double underhooks, defended well circling back out in, into the open cage good power hook to the body I mean Fleminas is such a rangy striker and when you pair that range with his unpredictability I always say it you don't know where the next striker is going to come from the guy will throw an uppercut and make it look like it's probably going to be a hook he just has a very very unorthodox way of fighting and you know it, it really threw Skibber off in that first round Skibber did manage to get the takedown at one point he just caught Fleminas off balance as Fleminas was kicking. It was a great timing from Skibber. But, you know, Fleminas immediately gets his back to the fence, works his way up, and then with a few seconds remaining of the round, cracks a few knees to, to Skibber's head. That's what ended the round. And it was, you know, already like a very comfortable 10-9 for, for the Latvian Express. And then in round two, just pretty much 
as as the round begins, Fleming has powers forward, gets this gorgeous head kick that knocks the mouthpiece out of Skibber's mouth, then rushes Skibber, clean uppercut. Really just a picture perfect uppercut. Yellow gloves pod on Twitter. If you want to see it, just go to the media section. I did tweet out the finish. Just gorgeous, right? Gorgeous uppercut. Gets the hook and then gets the ground and pound to finish it. Good stoppage. Skibber had no chance in there with Fleminas, in my opinion. And yeah, he's now on a he's on a two fight win streak. No one's more deserving of a title shot at 175 at 170 pounds, in my opinion. There's, there's no one. If he isn't one half of that title match, we riot. And I I am here for when Maddis Fleminas becomes Cage Warriors welterweight champion because I've been campaigning for this for the longest time and there are a few fighters that deserve it more. Props to Maddis Fleminas. Another excellent performance. Another very memorable finish in a career, in a pantheon full of full of amazing finishes for him. Knocked out Oban Elliott, knocked out Jesse O'Holin, knocked out Skibber. He's starting to really find his find his hands as well later on in his career. Just a top fighter, one of my favourite Cage Warriors fighters, one of my favourite fighters in MMA in general. Props to Maddis Fleminas. Let's get this man his title shot right fucking now. So Luke Riley versus Mateus Molto was the next fight on the card. And I was very impressed with Luke Riley again. I know you guys are probably thinking about Jesus, this guy never shuts the fuck up about Luke Riley, but honestly, one of my favorite fighters in Cage Warriors right now, one of the best prospects in, in all of Europe. And, you know, you'll probably look at his record now and you see, oh, he's got a couple of back-to-back -back decisions. You know, he's not finishing like he used to. And it's like, well, you're probably not watching the fights, right? Because Callum Parker, if he was made, if he had 5% less toughness, Luke Riley would have would have finished him at some point in that fight, which is the fight of the year so far for me. And then Mateus Malta again took a lot of shots that would have finished a lot of people. So the decisions for for people who look at records and they're like, oh, too many decisions that in a row he's not finishing as much as 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 he's as he used to, right? Who gives a fuck, right? Like watch the fights; they're super entertaining. This guy's proven that he can keep a pace across 15 minutes. Don't you hate it when there's a guy who finishes fights round one, early round two, and you never get to know what they're made of? What have we seen of Luke Riley in the last two fights? Callum Parker tested the shit out of Luke Riley. He had Luke Riley dead to rights in that first round. Luke Riley survived, made a great comeback, won the last two rounds, and put on an exceptional performance, right? Really exciting, incredible output to the head, to the body, as always messed up Callum Parker in those last two rounds and continued eating shots at the same time so yes I want to see these prospects go 15 minutes because I like to see what they're made of we don't want guys who are the minute they face some adversity fold right and in this fight it was the same thing although there was less adversity in this fight there was a heavy elbow that that Malta landed in the second round that definitely staggered Riley and you know there was some some grappling attempts from Malta and, and all of the conversation going into this was you know, can Malta out grapple Riley? What does Riley look like when he's getting grapple fucked, for lack of a better term? And Riley defended throughout all 15 minutes excellently. I can't even remember Riley ending up on his back at any point in this fight. I remember in the second round, Malta going deep on a double leg. And he might have gotten Riley down, maybe, maybe down to his butt. And then Riley just builds up to his knees, gets right back up. I mean, he's popping up every single time. Riley's looking massive, by the way, at 145 pounds. Like, I, I don't know how much longer he's going to be able to make the weight. Like, he's he's a big dude at featherweight. He looked great in this fight. The the Riley flurries were there. The lead hooks to the bodies, the rib roasters, as I call them, just beautiful. Malta was overwhelmed so many times, clinching up whenever he was getting getting I guess blitzed and getting getting overwhelmed. Like I said, just really good patented Luke Riley kneeing at the end of combos which is always nice to see hook into the head hook into the body that just that lovely style that, that we've come to to appreciate Luke Riley for and Malta was tough as shit like I said because most fighters would have folded especially by the third round and I loved seeing the patient and measured approach of Luke Riley I feel like he learned so many lessons from that Callum Parker fight just taking taking 10% off your shots being more measured 
and the output was perfect in this the cardio was perfect just a hard fought 15 minutes for Riley against the most experienced opponent he's faced to date like a guy with 13 pro fights Luke Riley this was his seventh so the matchmaking that that cage warriors have put for Luke Riley his whole career has been excellent they're taking their time with him but they're building and you can see that they're building him up obviously Callum Parker say what you will he was 2-0 and we didn't really know who he was but that was also short notice right the the actual matchmaking the fights that do happen Luke Riley's putting away prospects he's putting away veterans and he's proven that he can not only knock people out but he can go to full 15 and win he's now 7-0 and and I'd probably wager that he's ready to be thrown in there against some of the more established names at 145 pounds divisions wide open at the moment there's probably going to be a lot of movement continuous movement into into the UFC for a lot of guys Paul Hughes Shari of like, like I've mentioned great opportunity for Riley to start kind of stepping up and, and working his way towards the title I said at the beginning of the year in the next 18 months he's fighting for the belt and I will stick to that I think he'll fight again this year in Manchester hope it's against uh, a credible opponent someone with a not not saying that Malta isn't credible because he definitely was but a more renowned name a, a household name at 145 pounds in cage warriors I think that would be sick but Luke Riley again proven that he's one of the best prospects in the UK so the main card opener which was actually the prelim headliner but there were so many decisions in this card like early on that but there were so many decisions on this card early on where it kind of you know pushed this one into the main card we see it often in MMA I mean it happened at UFC London last night as well and the the main card headliner was a doozy Harry Hardwick versus Vitor Estevam Whew. what what can we say about that from Harry Hardwick his we'll get we'll get to the submission and actually the most interacted with tweet on the yellow gloves pod on twitter is the video of harry hardwick's submission so a lot of people enjoying what harry hardwick did in this fight or so happy for him because we spoke about it in the preview pod he mentioned that whenever he fights there's not really a big ufc um presence on the card in terms of scouts and in terms of how close it might be to a london card and he's mentioned obviously that george has had opportunities where he's probably been seen more by ufc staff and I was so happy for Hardwick that the day before UFC London, this man is doing what he did and the way that he did it. And we'll just get straight into it. I mean, first round, Hardwick was just walking Estevam down, prodding front kicks to the body, front kick to the face. It was definitely part of the plan, striking through the middle. The, the front kicks were just beautiful. He also had a nice left hook to disengage the clinch at one point. And I think the pace was just starting to really, really weigh Estevam down just teeing off on Estevan was Hardwick from either stance as well I mean him and George have such similar styles and it's so much fun to watch so many people like Hardwick bros need to be in the UFC tweeting at me Hardwick bros need to be in the UFC get the Hardwick bros in the UFC the fact that George has to go through Dana White contender series I've already ranted about that and I don't want to kind of pop a pop a vessel um, or have a brain aneurysm here because yeah I mean it's stupid enough right but Harry should be in the UFC as well I mean the idea of those two being in there I mean it's great marketing for the UFC look what they've done with the the Bonfim brothers just get get Harry in there as well like do the do a little two for one right George beats his guy in 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 Dana White's contender series just sign Harry Hardwick as well why not I mean yeah Hardwick just just to get back to this fight Estevam did land a couple of nice straight shots towards the end of the round but Harry Hardwick was just the pace melted Estevam and when they both went to their corners at the end of the first round I immediately just in my notes I was like Estevam is done and in the second round very early Estevam rushes forward Hardwick uses a tie clinch to turn Estevam and as he's turning him just the most incredible slickest subs that you'll see just he turns so it's hard to describe from an audio perspective right but i'm sure anyone listening to this you've, you've probably seen it if you've not yellow gloves pod on twitter but yeah hardwick uses the tie clinch turns estevam and then in that same sequence as they're moving as he's turning 
Estevan just climbs on his back, gets both hooks in, chokes him unconscious, right? Like Estevan was out for a split second there. But what I loved about the choke is that you couldn't even see. Hardwick was choking him so hard that you couldn't even see Hardwick's arm underneath the neck of Estevan. All you could see was just like a gap between Estevan's chin and his chest. And you could just imagine that there was an arm underneath there. One of the most slickest subs I've seen in a while. Harry Hardwick is a G. Harry Hardwick is in the title conversation. Don't care what anyone says. Don't think he's going to be in the UFC for very long, especially if George does well in his contender series showcase, whatever you want to call it. I think the UFC will be salivating at the idea of having two brothers who are super charismatic, super entertaining, always come to fight, always put on incredible shows, technically gifted, technically capable. And Hardwick's a grinder as well. Harry Hardwick, that is. He's a grinder, doesn't get enough credit for it. Good wrestling, good grappling. Will take a fight there if he has to. But this this submission here was immediately, I popped it in my notes for finish of the year. Um, right there in with all the other nominees that I've got. Just Harry Hardwick, take a bow. I think for me, finish of the night, 100%. All right, and so we kind of crash down into the prelims now. I will eventually kind of go through them a bit quickly, especially as we get towards the, the beginning of the prelims. But we'll start top down as we always do. Will Curry versus Jorge Bueno. Really good performance from Will Curry. Probably for, for me, at least the highlight of the fight was when uh, Will Curry let off a few sneaky elbows to the back of Bueno's head. Mark Goddard literally just steps in and starts fucking harassing Will Curry. It was the funniest thing. He's just just shouting at him, saying that it's illegal. Will Curry started to argue, which arguing of Mark Goddard seems like probably the worst idea, right? Because Goddard just gets right in his face and he's like, I don't need to see the replay. I was standing right there, you know, blatant two, three elbows to the back of the head. Will Curry just kept drawing away and drawing away. And you could tell Goddard just wanted to <laughs> whack his gi on and just fucking take will curry down and, and, and do something bad to him i mean it was it was just just super funny obviously tongue-in-cheek naturally obviously goddard wasn't wasn't fucking pissed in there but it was it was funny to see but actually just proven to me that that goddard is the, the gold standard when it comes to officiating just a top referee ref this fight incredibly well also ref another fight on this card incredibly well which we'll get to but will curry great to see him back obviously the 9-9 round in the first round because of the point deduction due to the elbows to the back of the head but in the second round it was again one-way traffic for will curry uh bueno attempted this body lock takedown early curry framed off you know builds back to his feet and then is the one who takes bueno down gets on top in half guard starts raining down elbows legal ones this time and gets the stoppage right it was it was textbook will curry just going in there bullying someone like He's, he's just, Will Curry's a specimen, right? He's just a massive fighter. Great to see him back in the win column. Only a few months ago, he lost the title match against Stanton. A lot of fighters would have gone, licked their wounds, you know, would have taken a, a while to come back to find themselves, blah, blah, blah. Will Curry was like, no, fuck that. I'll come back in a few months. And, and so he did, right? Jorge Bueno, not an established name by any means, but, you know, a, a credible fighter nonetheless in Brazil. And... Like I mentioned in the pod, he's also got some experience fighting in Europe. So it's not like, you know, his first time in Europe and, and he was having issues adapting and, and all of that. Just a decent fighter for Will Curry to take on, but another kind of big win for Curry. Good to see him back in the win column. He will be in that title conversation. I know a lot of people are also saying you do Curry versus Stanton. I think you do Stanton Stewart because it kind of makes more sense. We've just seen Curry Stanton. It was competitive and it was you know some people say that, that they disagreed with the scorecards I didn't but let's let's put let's do Stanton Stewart and then Curry versus someone put that on the co-main maybe Curry and Bonner potentially put that on the co-main of that card winner fight Stanton or winner fight Stewart and just just let 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 it build a little bit I don't want this fight to be thrown at Stanton immediately I would like to I would like to see the Stuart fight. Stuart's gone on a nice run since since Stanton beat him. There's been more time between that fight. That's the fight that you do. But Will Curry that 
I'll, I'll just go out on a limb and say, well, there's no way that Will Curry isn't a Cage Warriors champion at some point in his career before the UFC come in and snap him up. These things take time. He's still young, but he will get there. Great performance from Will Curry. And so we come into Angus Hewitt versus Connor Hayes. This was a bonkers fight, actually probably the fight of the night if we had to really pick one. Obviously Stanton and Webb was amazing for that one round, but this one had so many insane momentum shifts. Hewitt, someone that I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be quite candid and say that, and I, it probably came across in the preview pod, don't really, didn't really think much of Hewitt, came in against, against McCory, got absolutely smoked. And I just thought he was going to be one of those guys that just comes in, does a job, and eventually gets beaten by the prospects, right? And, you know, Hewitt's, a, Hewitt's just a, a newly turned pro as well. Like, he's not... It's not like he's some veteran who's just come in and, and taken losses, right? Like, he's got a credible amateur career. The loss to McCory happens. McCory's a great fighter. Connor Hayes, though, was a big favorite in this one. Another guy making his pro debut felt like cage warriors were setting hewitt up a little bit just because of what just happened to hewitt a few months back in dublin and you know hewitt was just really really impressive to me um hayes did drop hewitt wobbled him well it was hard it was hard to see if he dropped him because they were kind of tangled up as well at the same time so maybe it was a slip hard to tell i have reviewed like the footage a few times but it looked like he dropped hewitt in the clinch early Hewitt tangled up with him as they were going down, ended up on top, bleeding heavily. Then when they got right back up, Hewitt had a flying knee attempt. Hayes clocked him with a beautiful right hook, which you know forced Hewitt to shoot out of desperation. But in shooting out of desperation, secured the takedown. And towards the end of that first round, I thought Hayes won the round. But there was a big argument that Hewitt stole it in the last 45 seconds because he started pounding away at Hayes on top from closed guard just insane the amount of elbows and strong like shots that this guy was throwing like really powerful shots I thought it was going to get stopped at one point I did think Hayes kind of edged around a bit because he did have he did drop Hewitt in my opinion he did force him to shoot out of desperation a few times but you could feel like the momentum had switched at that point and then in the second round Hayes lands a nice uppercut on Hewitt which definitely troubles Hewitt but they tangle again like the footwork was weird in this fight and it might be because you know Hayes is making his debut and they're both still so green in their careers that you know getting tangled up and, and your footwork not always being where you want it to be can happen. Hewitt obviously tangles up a bit of Hayes, Hayes ends up on top, lands some good strikes, all Hayes halfway through the round and it seemed like Hewitt was seemingly happy to accept the position getting some angle changes in but then not not much was happening Hayes was sitting on top not throwing a crazy amount Rich Mitchell stood them up and that was Rich Mitchell's like just bleed moment because what happened afterwards like immediately afterwards that Hayes rocked Hewitt Hewitt rocked him back just an incredible slobber knocker back and forth Hewitt then ended up on top just the most insane momentum shift in that moment Hewitt started landing strike after strike after strike. This guy's got some vicious ground and pound. Brutal, brutal stuff. Rich Mitchell stepped in, stopped the fight. Great fight. At one point, you thought Hayes was going to win. At one point, you thought Hewitt was going to win. Then Hayes was back on top. Then Hewitt took over. Then Hayes rocked Hewitt. Hewitt rocked Hayes. Hewitt took the fight to the ground and got the finish. An awesome, awesome fight. You know, all respect to Angus Hewitt. I will hold my hands up. I didn't I didn't think that he was capable of this because he hadn't been billed to me as, as a fan. He hadn't been billed to me as, as someone who could do this. But now we know that we've got a really kind of tough guy. Paddy McCory's win ages really well after that performance from Angus Hewitt. Connor Hayes will be back. Pro debut shit happens. I mean, Hewitt can probably relate to that, right? Hewitt came in in his pro debut and got knocked out. So Connor Hayes will be back. Very exciting fighter still on the amateur circuit. Great submission specialist as well. I'm sure we'll see him in there again at some point this year. And so we move on to discuss what was the knockout of the night. I was going to say finish of the night, but Hardwick's just, I think it might have been better. Even though, you know, visually and viscerally, Emil Brown versus Jesse O'Holin, what an incredible, incredible knockout. 
It's just the, the most beautiful picture perfect apple cart. And actually, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into it. We'll get into it. I just want to preface this by saying that I was very, very pleased with Emil Brown. I thought his interview after the fight with, I think it was Violent Money, he said that he's not that kind of guy who's going to sit around, lose to a grappler, and try to cherry pick fights and hope to fight a guy who's going to stand and bang with him and all of that. Emil said he wanted, after you know, after losing to Skiba, after getting handily, you know, blanketed by Skiba, he said that he wanted his next fight to be against the grappler. And what better fight than you know a Finnish grappler, a guy like Jesse O'Holin, who is an awesome, awesome wrestler. He's a relentless wrestler, He's a train wrestler, just a guy who's just gonna keep shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting. And early on, you know, Emil had the crisp jab early, but O'Holin was wrestling and wrestling. O'Holin was all over him against the fence. Emil defended well, though. He was showing really good kind of defensive aptitude. He did get Emil down at one point. Emil popped right back up. O'Holin got him down again. You know, navigated to the back, but Emil was doing a great job defensively. O'Holin was kind of smothering him, but... Emil Brown wasn't getting, you know, there were no submission attempts. He wasn't getting pounded out. Like, he was smart. He was measured. He didn't do anything kind of crazy or, or anything to, to jeopardize the position he was in. Eventually, manages to, to get his way back to his feet. And then what we saw was one of the best knockouts of the year. Because out of nowhere, you know, a hole in goes for a head kick. Emil blocks the head kick. And just off that momentum of blocking the head kick, delivers an uppercut that was I tell you straight from the depths of hell just an incredible incredible uppercut as O'Holin's falling from the uppercut he his head bounces off his own knee so it's a bit of a nasty knockout as well because you know the double impact to the head just yeah visually a beauty from Emil Brown I was the first to criticize him after the Skibber fight because I know he's capable of so much better he had Skibber dead to rights and he rushed and in Russian, he kind of blew his load and gave away his position, right? Or, or gave away position, sorry, and got got blanketed, right, by by a veteran in Skibber. But to think that people jumped off the Emil bandwagon after the loss to Skibber, shame on you all. Emil Brown is still the real deal, in my opinion. At welterweight, still someone to keep an eye on. Incredible knockout power a great attacker of the neck doesn't get enough respect for that great submission game that he has beating Jesse O'Holin I know O'Holin's now coming off two losses I don't care this guy is still a very good fighter a great great win for Emil Brown one that we'll definitely be talking about as one of the nominees for knockout of the year or finish of the year even at the end of the year it's definitely on my short list having this and Hardwick on the same card I mean it's, it's just insane what both of them did but Emil Brown definitely with the knockout of the night. All right, and now we get into the portion of the prelims that I'm probably going to go through a bit quicker than, than I normally would, only because after the next fight is quite uneventful. But the next fight, of course, is uh, Grant Ogborn versus Takamandu. Takamandu stepping in on, I believe, less than a week's notice. And he was exceptional. Genuinely so good. This fight will be dominated by the fact that there were, I believe, four dick kicks from Grant Ogborn. <laughs> um, yeah, low blows if you want to be political and you, you don't want to say bad words. Um, but yeah, four dick kicks from Ogborn. What, like, the, I believe the third one is what got him his point deduction. But, you know, flowers for Takamandu because when he debuted in Cage Warriors on the Dublin card, he laid an egg and he knows that. And it was very disappointing for someone who's so highly rated, especially by the Irish MMA media, someone who's gone through so much in his career, comes in here on short notice against Grant Ogborn, and he was sensational. The jab was beautiful. I believe the first strike he threw in the fight was a really crisp straight hand, cut Ogborn right open underneath the eye. A few jabs later, and Ogborn had a cut above the eye. So on the same eye, he had a cut underneath it and above it as well, just... Yeah, Takamandu mangled his face up. As we progressed within the fight, it started to add up all of that pressure from Takamandu, all the jabs. Just Ogborn was throwing less and less, and he started to throw with reckless abandon, and he wasn't really kind of protecting himself, not too much anyways. Takamandu was just doing a great job at resetting positions, circling out, and jabbing to stagger Ogborn's pace. Ogborn was throwing a lot of spinning stuff, and 
Takaman was just in the right place at the right time. Always his footwork was just so, so clean in this fight because every time that he threw, he wasn't there anymore. As Ogborn was trying to counter, Takamandu wasn't there, just in and out, really earning his nickname of the cat. You know, very, very agile, very lithe in there. Just an awesome performance from him towards the end of the third round. Big right hand from Takamandu. It just bounced Ogborn off the fence, didn't it? Like if you've seen it, it you know, Ogborn went crashing into the fence, came back. Ogborn shot out of desperation. Gas tank looks like it was depleting heavily by the second had the dick kick which was the fourth one after that moment and you know eventually just towards the end of the round just when you feel like it's probably going to go a decision and Takamandu's going to win a very comfortable 30-26 Takamandu lands a really nice spinning back kick to the body right hand jab just a lot of attrition Mark Goddard sees enough steps in great stoppage right Goddard ref this really well with the low blows gave Ogborn the opportunity to you know not do that anymore <laughs> Ogborn kept doing it so I think he refed it really well with the point deduction and it was a good stoppage in my opinion I know some people were complaining about it because you know he didn't get dropped or anything like that but sometimes a guy's too tough for his own good and I think that was the case here with Grant Ogborn Takamandu great to see him kind of living up to the hype great to see him get a win under his belt in the yellow gloves very excited to see what he can do in the future now we get to the part of the card which you know wasn't exceptionally interesting i'd say the card definitely warmed up from the takamandu fight onwards that's when it got really really good but we had uh wesley meyer versus shazan kadrian i warned everyone in in the pod i know kadrian is is a prospect i know he's undefeated and you know he he's definitely an exciting fighter but don't sleep on wesley meyer just because he's not got the the exciting sexy appealing record that that kadrian has Wesley Myers a veteran and he looked so so good when he came back after a two three year hiatus that it was looked incredible in his last fight and here he just looked sensational the calf kicks unbelievable dropped Kadrian a couple of times with them had him moving real gingerly Maya treated Kadrian like the you know green newcomer that he that he was just the most conclusive 30-27 schooling that you'll see of a veteran taking on like an, an upcoming uh you know an up-and-coming talented prospect and yeah Maya just completely stuffed him completely just dominated him not a crazy amount to say about that fight Wesley Maya though keep an eye on him because I think Wesley Maya could do some really really big stuff at bantamweight I'm not even joking like the the vibe that he's in right now the work that he's doing of GB top team I think he's turned a new leaf. The last two fights, Bogdan Babu and now Shazan Kadrian. I think Maya could really. I'm not saying we're talking. We're not talking titles here, but we're talking he could get very, very close to one at some point because, yeah, the, the, just the, the mind state that he's in right now. He's got the bleached hair, you know, going for the Dubronk style. Just a really, really good fighter. Very well rounded. They keep feeding him prospects. He he might start knocking off a few prospects the cage warriors might want to be a bit careful matching Maya up against some of the more appealing names in this in this division Liam Gittins versus uh Yana Elanon Komala Komala obviously a massive veteran uh Liam Gittins doesn't really care about that he's on an incredible run at 145 pounds please Liam Gittins if for whatever reason you're listening to this don't move back down to 135 because Faisal Malik Rory Evans and now Komala, that's a great, great run. And you finished all of them. Just just insane, really. In this fight, though, just to give a quick kind of recap of it, Gittins just powered forward early. Really did a good job actually using the elbow as a high guard to, to disguise the strikes, but also to, to give different looks to Komala. Komala's obviously a veteran. Came in on, on short notice as well. Actually, there was a really wholesome moment in the... Uh, at the weigh-ins because Kumal actually gifted Liam getting something uh, at the face-off which is always a bit weird because you never know what the hell it's going to be and then you know Cage Warriors posted a video of, of Gittins opening the parcel or the package and it was just a pair of socks and I don't know I saw the Konami thing on it so I don't know maybe maybe Dragon Ball related socks I don't know maybe something for Liam Gittins to answer if you are listening to this Liam uh, DM me or something because I'm very interested to know what was what was on those socks of yours 
Uh, but yeah, back to the fight. Gittins really good shift in one two, which which did drop Kumala, and then a flurry of elbows on the ground that cut Kumala right open. It was just battering him on the ground. Was Gittins just over and over again? Ref warning Kumala to to fight back. He he wouldn't. And yeah, ref had, had seen enough. Just a relentless one rounder from Gittins. Like I said, incredible run at 145 pounds. Rich Mitchell did a good job stopping it when he did because it was just going to keep getting ugly. Gittins is, is someone that's really kind of found his legs now in Cage Warriors. Excited to see how they match him up next. So uh, this is where the probably where the card gets not very interesting to, to discuss. So, you know, excuse the brevity, but I'm just going to kind of whiz my way through. Uh, Tom Mearns versus Bailey Gilbert. Guys, I'm not going to sugarcoat this one. I try to be as as impartial as possible when covering this stuff. I know a lot of the fighters do tune in to the pod, but you know I've I've got to say it like it is in this in this instance. Tom Mearns missed weight by four pounds, and I've always had immense amount of respect for Tom Mearns. He's a grinder. He's a dog, and you saw it in this fight. He's tough as nails, right? Um, in this fight against Bailey Gilbert, he missed weight by four four and a half pounds. I think it was actually uh, in total. There was a four and a half pound discrepancy between both fighters. He did forfeit 50% of his purse. I don't think this fight had, should have gone, you know, it, well, how do I put this into better words? I don't think this fight should have happened, in my opinion. It should have been cancelled. I know that sucks. And, you know, you don't want to see fighters out of pocket. But And Bailey Gilbert probably doesn't give a fuck. He's like, I just want to fight. But when you're giving up four and a half pounds at weigh-in against a guy who's known for grappling, against a guy who's known for being top heavy against a guy who's known for for clinch wrestling against someone who's going to hold you against the fence and Tom Mearns I just think it was it was a bit shitty for this fight to go ahead uh, I'm just going to call it as it is hard for me to celebrate this one because the method in which Mearns won was by blanketing Bailey Gilbert and I don't care what anyone says that four and a half pounds at weigh in is is a huge huge advantage right anyone who's competed in anything that has weigh-ins, if you've wrestled jiu-jitsu, anything like that, even if you've if you've dabbled in MMA, you know how important those extra pounds are. And Tom Mearns missing by such an egregious amount. I mean, props to the guy for winning. I'm not going to sit here and, and discuss it as if it's anything that impressed me. To be honest for me, weight miss is egregious enough. Typically, I don't care about weight misses, but when they're like that, and when you win via positions where weight certainly matters, tough to celebrate it for me. So I'm just going to move on because... Not a crazy amount for me to talk about there. George Tanasa versus Wesley Machado is the next fight that we'll discuss. I had it 30-27 Tanasa. A really strange fight through no fault of his own. Wesley Machado was very, very weird. Karate stance, hands down. Weird, like, reminded me of, you know, if, if Genki Sudo sucked, right? And I, I'm not saying <laughs> Wesley Machado sucks. I'm not kind of attacking him. But obviously, Genki Sudo, a far more credible fighter than Machado. Um, is or probably will ever be right but it was it was pseudo-esque in the in the bizarreness of it in the the showmanship but also not doing a crazy amount I did think he did well in the first round Machado but only because Tanasa was struggling to to figure him out right but once Tanasa figured him out in the second and third round it's pretty much one-way traffic I did think Tanasa won the first as well but you know Machado was definitely being awkward uh, Tanasa had a really good like attacks to the body I think what he figured out would work for him is the strikes to the body, the straights to the body especially. That's what kind of won him the fight. He did drop Machado uh, halfway through the second round of a nice like clean left hand. I think he had Machado dead to rights, went for the takedown, probably could have finished him. 30-27 Tanasa. Fighter to keep an eye on. Figuring out a, a tough kind of puzzle like Machado isn't always easy, but he did it on the fly. He did it comfortably, 30-27 Tanasa. And then the opening fight on the card, which was the, the first fight on the prelims, was Ander Sanchez versus Tom Creasy. Tom Creasy, you know, yes, the brother of Sam Creasy, as you probably all know. Ander Sanchez, a fighter I'm very fond of because no matter what happens in a fight, Ander Sanchez is always, always a risk to, to finish you, right? Go watch the Lana Kavanaugh fight. I still think he's given Kavanaugh the toughest fight of his career. He dropped Kavanaugh in that in that fight. And then and then go watch his last fight where he's getting handily dominated, right? He's getting beaten from pillar to post, drops for a heel hook, gets a submission out of nowhere. One of the best comeback wins of the year. This is just what Ander Sanchez does. Tom Creasy took away any of like the 
the awkwardness or any of the of the danger of Ander Sanchez. Creasy got him down and kept him down for three rounds. Really clean 30-27. Last few seconds, Rich Mitchell was hovering and, and was about to stop the fight. I think if it had been 10 seconds longer, probably would have been a finish for Tom Creasy. But it wasn't 30-27 in my opinion. Really, really clean performance from Tom Creasy. Sure, we'll see him again. Ander Sanchez will always be a live dog against anyone. Sure, we'll see him at some point later on in this year. Super active fighter. But yeah, that's that's effectively Cage Warriors 157. A phenomenal card. I know as we've discussed the fights towards the end here, probably doesn't sound like it. It did take a few fights for it to warm up. But once we got to the Takamandu fight and, and from there onwards, it felt really, really special. A lot of prospects delivering on their on their hype, fun back and forth scraps, great finishes, incredible finishes. Even like you know finishes of the year, uh, candidates that we had in uh, Emil Brown and Harry Hardwick, comeback of the year contender. You know for for Stanton with the way that he uh, he he looked dead to rights to me and against James Webb and and he went there and, and then finished James Webb. Just an awesome awesome fight. An awesome card, really well put together by Ian Dean and the matchmakers at Cage Warriors. Another banger in London. One of my favorite, this will probably go down as my favorite card of the year. I know there's still stuff upcoming, but it's going to be really, really tough to top this one. But we've got the Rome card coming up as well. We've got Shadjid al Huck versus Martignoni for the flyweight title. Some really good fights on that card as well. I love the Dario Bilandi, uh, Naglius Kanesauskas fight. I think that's going to be awesome. The return of Mason Jones. Dimitri Gerlin coming off his insane, insane knockout over Adam Cullen versus Leon Hill, who's definitely, you know, on a on, on a path right now to to contending for a title, I think. I mean, you know, what he did at Dublin was 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 exceptional. Sylvester Miller's back as well, Mr. Headbutt, which I know a lot of people will enjoy. But yeah, that, that title fight, that title fight to me is really interesting because you know, Hacks fought so hard to get to this point in his career where he's got the title around his waist. And Martignoni is just such a good fighter, such a good grappler. It's going to be a really competitive fight. I think perhaps Martignoni edges it if you want a pick because I'm not going to be doing a preview. But I think, yeah, I think it's just going to be a really, really good card. If you did enjoy the pod, please give it a like, subscribe, comment, and I will catch you all on the next one.